The scripture reading today is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Now, during those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. The word of the Lord. Take a moment now for silent reflection. Okay, we'll just leave it there. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to be with you. Finally in person. I'm not stranded in an airport. Thank the Lord. Yes. So great to be with y'all. Um, my name is Angie. I'm really, really grateful to be. Um, I feel like I'm sort of kind of part of the community, even though I don't really live here or go to church here. But I really um, am so grateful to be here with y'all today. I got asked to lead worship at a friend's uh, church um, in rural North Carolina. It's a Presbyterian church, and um, I, they needed a worship leader to come and pinch hit for another one that they had um, who was absent. So I came in um, and that day with my big, huge keyboard, and I arrived there at the, at the small rural church in North Carolina, and <laughs> I noticed that everybody walking into church had on bright red. Like they were wearing red dresses, they were wearing red shoes, people had red socks, red ties, the whole thing. At the time, I was eight months pregnant with my first child and I was wearing a bright purple dress. So I walk in and I'm like, hey everybody, what's up? Bright purple dress, everybody's wearing red. I did not know at the time um, what a big deal Pentecost was, <laughs> but, that was but that was Pentecost Sunday. And, um, and they took it very seriously in the dressing, and I was totally out of step. But I will say that really prompted me to think of why Pentecost was such a, such a big deal and that led me to the book of Acts, and it kind of led to an obsession with the book of Acts. So hallelujah for the big purple dress that I wore that day. It led to that because I, I, I noticed that they took it very seriously in their ritual with what they were wearing, but also uh, how they took that lectionary very seriously that day. And so, you know, the book of Acts is great. And we had two, you had two great weeks of people opening up sort of the book of Acts um, amongst you. And I listened to those sermons and I was rejoicing um, because I love the book of Acts, right? Like, don't y'all love it? Because it, it kind of is like an action movie. It's like, a, it's like a fantasy action thriller movie. There's like people that are being raised from the dead, people who are dropping dead, people who are dying for the cause. There's multiple arrests, right? And people breaking out of jail, you know, like there's the episode where the jail breakout is like through a handbasket down a wall, right? And then you have comedy because the Holy Spirit like just opens up the jail and they walk right out. I mean, that's, that's a comedy moment, right? And then there's, there's women action heroes, right? Like Priscilla Aquila, 
to have the, all those folks. And then um, there's also great philosophical debates, right, in Athens. Then there are the heroes, you know, of course, Jesus. Then we have Stephen. Then we have all these other folks until, like, Paul sort of takes over the whole entire book at the end. And we have kings, um, and we have a shipwreck. We have people jumping ship. And then finally, Paul just sort of, it sort of ends with Paul in the great Italian city of Rome just sitting there by the seaside or something. I don't know, I'm making this up, where he's just like teaching and preaching, and that's how it ends. That's like a movie, right? I mean, I don't know. Um, that's, just, that's just what I think. But here in this um, Acts 6 chapter is none of that action. <laughs> it's none of that action, actually. And I wondered for a long time, why was I given this passage? Because... Uh, you know, I like the exciting stuff, you know, I don't know. Um, but I wondered, you know, why did Luke think to involve this cameo, like, episode um, in this, all this action-packed drama that was happening during the Acts of the Holy Spirit? And in that, I kind of got a chance to sort of open up that moment, and I'm really, really grateful. And that's what we're going to look at today. Because at Pentecost, which happens in Acts 2, which is sort of the highlight of the book of Acts, people refer to it all the time. You know, people as a worship leader who does like diverse worship, they're like, yeah, it's like Acts 2. We want Acts 2 kind of worship at our church. Like, do it, you know? I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. But, but at Pentecost, this intimate knowing of each other of the diaspora, I wanted... I. I wanted to sort of flesh out the fact that they still had some things in common. You had the home team Jew Jewish folks that were in, already in Jerusalem, and then you had everybody else, but everybody was still of the Jewish Hebrew faith. They shared that sort of lineage from Abraham, that faith. And so even though they got to know each other intimately, they were still sort of, they still had a few things in common. And we start here at Pentecost in people knowing each other and being community. And I wonder if Acts 6, right, was sort of like the morning after, you know, like, like this huge miracle happens. Everybody's knowing each other. Everybody is just saturated with the Holy Spirit. It's this beautiful thing. And then they wake up the next day and they have to live everyday life together. They got to figure it out. Here, the Hebrews, Jews, the home team, right, are going about their daily business. And the Hellenist Jews notice that even amongst them, there is some sort of separation. Even though they have this great bonding moment, there is a separation. And they decide to uh, complain about it. They raise a fuss about it. And they took it to the center of the community, which is at the time the, Hebrew, the Hebrews of the Jewish faith. Um, and I wonder here if we can pull up that uh, Gregory of Nyssa quote. The, one of the church fathers of the, of the early church said this. Where is that quote? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, there we go. Okay. The establishment of the church is recreation of the world, right? That's what happened at Pentecost. But it is only in the union of all the particular members that the beauty of Christ's body is complete. And even though they shared the Jewish faith, they shared sort of that lineage, they were the diaspora. And they were, they were taking this opportunity to say, we need to live into this unity of our particulars, even amongst us. There are particulars even amongst us. And so here, the earliest church, right, has this opportunity. They have multiple opportunities here. How will the leadership respond, first of all? How will they be heard? In what ways are, is this conflict, this slight conflict, going to be resolved? What they said was really interesting the Hellenist Jews sort of came and they said, you know, we're trying to remix our faith right now, right, with, with, um, with Jesus and now being saturated and penetrated with the Holy Spirit with each other. 
Can we keep this one, though? Can we keep this one to remember the poor, the widows, the children amongst us? And that, can that include even us, the diaspora? This was the concern. This was the conflict. And at this moment, the center could have really responded in a huge number of ways. And I'm sure all of us who have maybe been a part of any institution, um, especially the church, have seen conflicts like this arise, right? Can we remember this ministry? Can we remember the poor? Can we address the situation? What is the work that we're actually trying to do here? And I think for a lot of us who um, have found ourselves displaced or wondering about what church community looks like in this new season where we're trying to gather ourselves back together, I wonder if we feel like it's safe enough to even ask those questions. Some of us have been burned so badly. It's as if we're saying, you know, we've brought our concerns to you. We've brought our concerns to the leaders. We have pointed things out. We've pointed out things like abuse. We've pointed out things like people here are not being served. We're not loving each other in the ways that we've been called. We're not really being saturated by the Holy Spirit. It's almost like we're being saturated with something else here. Will you hear us, leaders? And I wonder if that's part of the great resignation of the church right now. I wonder if this passage, uh, this small seven verses in Act 6, where there's really no sort of groundbreaking, thrilling action happening here, can teach us about how the leadership responded. So the first is this. They came together. They brought everybody together, right? So they acted in transparency. They wanted everybody to witness, to be there, like a town hall community meeting, to discuss the problem of what was going on. How easily they lost sight of Pentecost when they had everything in common and they shared everything. How could this have happened? They also held themselves accountable, right? They said, yeah, I, we realize we own up to it and we confess that we have not been taking care of everybody even here in our midst. The diaspora, it, we became separate again. We didn't come together in our particulars. We became a little bit separated. We need to end this right now. Then they realized, oh my gosh, there aren't any of the Hellenist Jews that are represented amongst us in our leadership. Let's appoint some people. Let's give them that very real task of continuing to call out these things and give them leadership positions in order for things to change. Maybe these people know exactly how to address this issue in ways that we don't know because we don't understand what it was like to be so dispersed and scattered throughout the Roman Empire. We've been here. So they appointed these seven people, these seven uh, people to be sort of the, the bishops, right, to address these concerns. And it's really interesting because, you know, in the, in the movie story sense, only two of these people are mentioned again in the entire book of Acts, and one has a storyline. The others sort of fade away. We don't really hear from them again. But they were appointed, they were named by the folks to be the leaders to address the situation. Something about that is so powerful. Oscar Romero was a priest, and he was a part of the Catholic Church. He was a priest in the Catholic Church, and a lot of his congregation um, were poor. And he would go on the radio. He was, so, um, he was so great in doing this, but he would go on the radio and he would call each of these people who, were, um, who lacked resources, who were dying on the streets of starvation. He would call those names by name, 
every week on the radio during his sermon uh, broadcast. And what that did, right, it, it awakened attention to, how, to what the government was doing at the time. And it cost him, it was so costly to, and risky to do that. It was a risky act, and eventually he was martyred for it. But the act of naming is so powerful. So they named these seven, and they were to address these issues. This is how uh, they, they decided to engage in this uh, conflict, this minor conflict that would arise among them. And finally, something is so great about this touch. They blessed them, they put hands on them, and they, they said, go and do this very, very important work of addressing this issue. And thank you for uh, not separating us, right? That we are still gathered in our particulars. When, during the... Um, during the pandemic, when we were in lockdown, I got to go to every conference that I could never go to in real life as like a, being a busy mom and a student at the time. And one of these conferences that I went to was um, API Women Lead, which is Asian American sort of women, activists, community organizers. And there was one workshop that I was really, really interested in, in going to, and that was um, by Mia Mingus, who is Asian American and um, does a lot of activism and community organizing in Oakland. I was so excited to hear her. I'd heard so many things. She sort of kind of um, defined or helped to establish transformative justice, sort of a mode of justice, right? And a really great thinker, a blogger, super low tech, because she's just in the trenches every single day. And so I was really eager to see what Asian American organizing looked like, because I live in North Carolina, there's not that many of us. I wanted to learn from the best, from people who had been doing it for a while. So she gets up in her workshop, and I'm really eager, everybody's eager, the chat is going crazy, like, yeah, Mia Mingus, we love you. So then she begins, and she starts by outlining how these are the steps in how to give an apology. She's like, first, <laughs> you, you, you acknowledge the harm. I mean, she goes through all these steps, and we're like, what? I thought we're going to be learning about, like, organizing and, like, how to show up at a community council meeting or, or something. I don't know. But she describes about how to give an apology. The chat goes silent because people are a little shocked at what she's saying, to be honest. She kind of pauses and she says, you know, because if we don't learn how to resolve conflict here, how do we, how do people expect us to do it out there in the community? If we can't relationally learn to apologize, learn to own our mistakes, to take responsibility of our actions here, how will we do it out there? And I was really struck by that. I've been a part of so many institutions and especially Christian institutions where they were these great heroes doing great works, doing all these exciting things, in the photo ops, wearing the collars, on the front lines of protests. Yet their organizations were a mess, or they had been estranged from their whole entire families. How could that all fit together? And I thought, like, that is so, it's just so common. I thought about how common that was. And I realized that there's something true to what Mia Mingus was talking about, because she had probably seen a lot of community organizing and activists having these conflicts, not being able to resolve it, and then it would just blow up in the community. And so she wanted to start out with, this is how to give an apology. These are the exact steps. Let's practice this. I thought it was so powerful, and I was really convicted that day. I learned a lot in that workshop, more than I ever 
imagined I could. I think the church is maybe at an opportunity, right, to consider who is among us in the midst of all this, like we just sang about, what can we do right here, right now, with our relationships, with our neighbors, with those who we share things in common with, that we're in community with, before we take these grand actions, before we do the virtue, virtue signaling, before we go to the protest and do the signs and do all these things, do we really know our neighbors? Are we thinking of the poor among us? Do we know them? M. Sean Copeland in In Fleshing Freedom writes, If my sister or brother is not at the table, we are not the flesh of Christ. If my sister's mark of sexuality must be obscured, if my brother's marks of race must be disguised, if my sister's mark of culture must be repressed, then we are not the flesh of Christ. If we can't be the flesh of Christ in here, how are we going to be the flesh of Christ when we are sent to the ends of the earth, to the edges of our capacity, to the edges of our communities and beyond? What kinds of family conversations do we need to have? Will we allow ourselves to be transformed by this community right here with our relationships right here and engage the work of justice right here by remembering those who are poor among us, those without among us, those who are suffering, who are depressed among us? Are we willing to deal with that first? And sometimes that is the hardest thing to do. But I tell you, this Acts chapter 6, this moment in time where they're addressing this, where they decide to engage in this in-house sort of conflict, this in-house issue, is the starting point because they will be, the Holy Spirit is about to send them Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit is about to incorporate somebody who's out on a, on a witch hunt for them that will end up, you know, taking over the whole book of Acts like in the last part, Paul. The Holy Spirit is going to finally send them to the Gentiles. These are people that they have been conditioned to hate as subhuman, as evil, as unclean, as illegal. That hasn't happened yet. Can we build the stamina here to go out there? And leaders among us, we allow ourselves for people to come to us and hold the mirror to our faces. Will we allow for that transformation to happen? I think the key to the church's survival and possible flourishing could be just that. Pentecost in Acts 2 isn't the one-time event. There's a Pentecost part two when the Gentiles come to Christ. There's a Pentecost part three when the disciples go to Ephesus, will we allow those moments of Pentecost to overtake us so that wherever we go, people will know, even if they show up in that bright purple dress, that there is something there. There's something amongst us that's worth listening to, that's worth giving a shot that's worth giving the church a shot again. I'm convicted by this small cameo episode in Act 6 
And I hope that for the rest of this time together, as we learn about all the great heroes, as we learn about Saul turning into Paul, we learn about Cornelius and the Gentiles, we learn about the shipwreck, we learn about the prison breaks, that we kind of keep this small episode in mind. That there are the poor, that there are those forgotten, that there are particulars even amongst us. Let's start there. Let's pray. Dear Holy Spirit, that picture of Pentecost down to the particulars of this conflict show that you are at work. Allow us to be so penetrated by you to be so married, to be in this covenantal bond with you so much that we can start small in order to act big, in order to go to the ends of the earth. Transform us and heal us. Let us be drawn to the work that you are doing even now. And thank you for not being done with us yet. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.